On the quest to discover what it means to be human, we come across life's lessons in many ways. We may find the answers in social media, through friends and family, or by chatting to a life coach or therapist. Yet if we take the time to observe nature, we find that she is constantly revealing to us how we should live our lives. Could it be that to be the best we can be, all we need do is to consciously emulate God's genius as reflected in our natural environment? In this program, we look at how people of faith are inspired by nature to follow their own particular paths with dedication and joy. Sacred secrets of nature. Uh, I think we ought to treat the all of life and this planet as sacred. It's such an incredible um, miracle in itself that we have this abundant life, this beauty of life on this planet. And instead of abusing it, we should consider that all aspects of life and all life on this planet are sacred. You know, nature's secrets and nature's uh, wisdom, intelligence, nature's mechanics are there for us to grow and evolve and understand how nature functions. That's what nature is there for. We can never, never completely and fully understand nature. And that brings us that respect, the reverence, the sacredness. And for many, this sacredness is accompanied by a feeling of being awestruck at the sheer scale and magnificence, not only of our natural environment, but of its maker too. Colin Jackson from A. Rosha, the Christian environmental organization, is constantly inspired by nature. The thing that really wows me and buzzes me is as I just even ride my bike to work in the morning in this beautiful city of Cape Town with the mountain just in crystal clear after the rain and a beautiful sunny morning, or out in the forest and with the sun filtering through the, the leaves of the trees, or getting a view of a bird through a good quality pair of binoculars or telescope. Just, you just home in on that bird and it's in brilliant lighting and you can see every feather in detail. And just the amazing beauty of that, that bird. Um, it just thrills me to know that I can have, that I, I know the God who created those. He put so much effort and detail in you know, the f single feather of a bird. Um, and, the, and feathers are incredible things, amazing things. If you, once you start to, start to study them and understand them, they're a ridiculous part of a bird, you know, the way that it helps the bird survive and fly and the lightness and the strength and the, the qualities of the color and everything. And as you understand that, you just think, gosh, this God we are serving is just amazing. And he loves me. John Green is a devoted Christian and past president of WESA, the Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa. I, I love the whole system of nature and I just cannot get over the wonderment of how it has all been so beautifully brought together and can only have been by divine creation. Spirit of God, you established the dance of creation. Bring life out of death. Bring order out of chaos. Call us to radical action, to care for the web of creation, to share our resources justly, and to work for the renewal of our Mother Earth. The most reverent Dr. Tabo Makoba makes a conscious effort to spend time away from the hustle and bustle of city life. I find God particularly uh, clear, visible and evident uh, in nature. And every seven years I go away for a 40-day retreat in the mountains uh, somewhere and, uh, and I find that I can uh, I become quiet and I 
I fast and I try to recharge, replenish my energies, and I found that much more than anything that my spiritual director says or any spiritual exercises like that I do, just walking, seeing the little ants, seeing the little uh, beetle, uh, seeing the flowers, um, uh, have got a very cathartic thing uh, for me. I mean, I find uh, God most evident, most clear in the aesthetics and the beauty of nature. And I become ready to uh, discharge my public witness. Mm. Father Sean Cosette says he is blessed to live in the Cape Floral Kingdom, home to the greatest concentration of plant species in the world. I've just returned from the West Coast where I spent a few days looking at the wildflowers and taking some photos of the wildflowers. And over and over again, as I encountered different people who were doing the same, I heard people saying that, you know, if we look at all of this, no one waters the plants, no one cares for them, no one feeds them, and yet year after year we have this beautiful array of flowers that just spring up. And over and over again I hear people saying, there must be something greater than us to be able to create this kind of intricacy that no one else needs to look after, that no one else needs to care for, that just comes up when the time is right. Uh, and, and year after year we see these flowers. And so for me, it's been such an inspiration to drive around and to see the beauty of creation and to know that we serve a God who is responsible for creating the beauty that we see around us. According to biomimicry scientist Shannon Royden Turner, nature has the answers to many of the world's problems if we just take the time to stop and take notice. I think the more you start to study nature and realize how extraordinary it is, the more you just realize that there is some divine order to, to what is taking place on our planet. And I think that's what's so amazingly inspiring. One of the amazing examples that we also think about is if you were just to sit back and observe the changes in season, I mean, how is that all orchestrated? You know, it's just this series of events that happens which are incredibly complex and the relationship between every, like how does a tree know when it's going to drop its leaves? What is behind all of that? So we constantly, when you really start to look at the complexity of what is going on and the enormity of what's going on, it's incredibly humbling because you can't help but see God in everything when you, when you really notice and you really start to observe and actually open your eyes and stop thinking that we are the center of intelligence and realize that everything around us is actually far more intelligent than, than we are. For Bishop Jeff Davies and his wife Kate, spending time in the natural environment is an essential part of their day-to-day -day lives. I experience God through nature, um, I think just in the wonder, the beauty, the magnificence of it. I really draw closer to God when I'm in nature, in the beautiful mountains or along the, the coastal seas and the waves crashing up and the hair, uh, wind blowing through one's hair. Um, and doing it in silence. So um, that silence is uh, very important. And, and Jesus, we know, has encouraged us to, to draw apart and have time with God. I believe though, that God is talking to us through the wonder of his creation. And by taking the time to revel in the wonders of nature and listen to that infinite voice of wisdom, we often start to develop a deeper appreciation of it. There are these three R's on this. It's re reuse, recycle and reduce uh, in terms of resources. Well, I like to add a fourth one, which is rejoice. And we like to start with that and saying, actually, as Christians, we need to rejoice and give thanks to God for the incredible diversity and beauty that he's put in, in the world around us. Um, and out of that thankfulness, out of that enjoyment, out of that thrill, 
that excitement about his creation than to say, wow, yeah, this really is worth taking care of. Observed in a spirit of mindfulness, nature abounds with qualities to emulate. From grass, we learn humility and resilience. The ever-changing seasons teach us about adaptability and the passage of time. From bees and flowers, we learn the power of collaboration and harmonious coexistence. And trees display by their own example how to be giving and grounded. Yet one of the most important lessons we imbibe from the natural world is the value of stilling our restless spirits. The deafening sounds and extreme noise of modern day life drown out our inner voice that God-given sense of intuition that enables us to navigate life's daily challenges. But it's not just our inner perception that is being subdued by the daily grind and chaos. As Ralph Waldo Emerson once eloquently put it, it is important to be silent if we are to hear the whispers of the gods. I think the very, very first thing that we can learn from nature is just to be quiet and to listen. It's something that we as individuals in our modern society have forgotten. We've become so urbanized, we just rush from meeting to meeting, looking at our watch, looking at our cell phones. This has become a life. But essentially, nature tells us, stop, listen to each other, listen to the world around you. Sister Pratiba Daya says that spending time meditating or contemplating in nature gives one the inner strength and wisdom to deal with life in a more positive and peaceful way. I think nature reminds us of what is our essence and therefore when I go to the mountains or to the beach and, and sit quietly, um, it's like it naturally draws you into solitude and that internal solitude resonates with what the innate quality of nature is as well. And so I think nature is a very powerful reminder of what we're really all about and what our essence is. And when I am, you know, going for a walk or, or, or just being outside even in the garden, there's always this, this feeling of, of connecting with life on a much more larger scale. I think on one level, as people, we tend to live so much in our heads, in a way. Uh, you know, just the incessant thinking and also this, this stimulation with technology that we're so obsessed with, in a way. And when you're out in nature, it, it reconnects you with the earth in one way. So just you know, weeding the garden in itself, I find it very, very um, helpful and, and, and just sort of makes one more grounded and also makes one become more present. Dr. Ian McCullum is a specialist wilderness guide, author and poet, as well as a director of the Wilderness Foundation. He says it is our task to rediscover ourselves in nature. Our origins are wild origins. We've come a long way in terms of the, the evolution of, of our species. It is, it is a kind of a reminder, if you like, that um, we are not only immensely privileged, but there are huge responsibilities that, that, that go with being, and I'm not ashamed to say this, of being the human animal. We are the human animal. How incredibly exciting. And I would suggest that in all of us there is a religious instinct. And that religious instinct is based on a deep, deep need to belong. It is one of the greatest human needs, is this need to belong. And that belonging occurs when you have a sense of connection with the other. If there's a sense of belonging, 
and there's a sense of gratitude, and with that comes a sense of respect for the existence of the other, then that respect, almost by definition, must be a respect which borders on the sacred. That is the space of the other. And so they ended up putting... Dr. Dana Baumeister works in the field of biomimicry, a relatively new science which looks at sustainable solutions to human challenges by emulating nature's patterns and strategies. Biomimicry really is about this deep connection that we have with the other species in the natural world. And what I watch when I see people learn from nature is that it's not all a process that happens up here. A huge part of that comes from the heart. And I think that peace that comes from the heart is a, an awaking and a remembering and a falling in love with the natural world. And what could be more spiritually important than that, than finding a place uh, once again, no longer being a lonely species and finding a place here on this planet. At a primal level, Buddhists say that observing nature also teaches us about our true home, about finding our place in the universe and discovering who we really are. Buddhist Annie Sondru Sonam says that immersing ourselves in the wilderness brings us wonder, joy and peace. I take people on wilderness trails, in, in, in wilderness area, contemplative trails, and I have never yet seen a person who is not completely transformed after a day or two in the wilderness, never. It doesn't matter who comes there, young or old, within two days, there is this incredible reconnection. It's a sense, and I ask people, you know, so they tell me, they feel, many, many people, they use the word home, home. Most ancient cultures and religious traditions recognized and revered nature for the timeless teachings that she silently imparts. Yet sadly, with our increasing alienation from our environment, we've come to regard the earth and her natural resources as a saleable commodity, something to be owned, evaluated and exploited for maximum financial gain. Nirmala Naya, founder of the School of Practical Sustainability, invites us to ask ourselves this question. How do we sustain life simply and gracefully with beauty and dignity? The answer, she says, lies in a deep appreciation of our interconnectedness with the natural world. And my mother used to have a word, uh, you know, I was brought up Hindu, and she always used to say, Chomar in Bengale, Chitra Vidambetu. I mean, it's a, in Malayalam, but it says this body uh, is like a temple and this is where you paint and your life is what you paint. So if you have this planet as the body, the cosmic body, and if you're living and if you're painting and if the, that sacredness has been reduced, commodified, commercialized, made it into a consumer, uh, you know, small parts that we can consume. Obviously, there is a splintering of that, you know, deeper, uh, bigger, cosmic, metaphysical relationship with nature. Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a pattern of soul, where every tree and bird and beast is a soul maker? Have we forgotten that wilderness is not a place, but a moving feast of stars, footprints, scales, beginnings? Since when did we become afraid of the night? And that only the bright stars count, or that our moon is not a moon, unless it is full? By whose command? With the animals, through groping fingers, one for each hand, reduced to the big and the little five. Have we forgotten that every creature is within us, carried by tides of earthly blood, and that we named them? Have we forgotten 
that wilderness is not a place, but a season, and that we are in its final hour. Getting involved in eco-friendly projects, either through our places of worship or through a broader spiritual commitment to the well-being of the planet, enables us to affect small but significant changes at a personal and community level. By affording us the opportunity to spend time outdoors, we get first-hand experience of Mother Nature, something that is essential if we are to draw from her wellspring of wisdom and learn her sacred secrets. The Western Cape has some inspiring examples of how to live sustainably within an urban context. The Aranyasucht city farm, for example, is based on a heritage site in the heart of the Cape Town City Bowl. A non-profit urban farming initiative, the project has played a role in uniting people from different faiths and backgrounds. This project, the Aranyasucht city farm, is a response to the fact that I've experienced people living behind high walls and lots of crime in this area and us being more and more isolated from each other and from nature and from the food we eat and from our beings and in a way this catalyst, this little farm that draws attention to the food we eat and the market that we have brings people together. Aside from supplying the surrounding neighborhood with a source of fresh organic produce, the farm seems to fulfill a deeper need for community members. And I think it's a yearning for people to do something larger than themselves. I think that's what got us all motivated to be involved here, that here was something that we could do that was a bigger picture, that had a bigger picture, that was bigger than our own little efforts at work or at home, building a bigger house or going, earning more money at work or trying to get ahead on this corporate ladder. Here was something that we could do that, that fed our souls. In addition to generating employment, Oranya Sicht City Farm also aims to create an awareness and appreciation of food cycles. Many people say to us, you know, that they know the name of their doctor and they know the name of their priest or they know the name of their lawyer, but they don't know the name of their farmer. And yet we eat twice, three times a day, every day. And we've lost that connection. And the likelihood of a farmer that you know selling you food that's bad for you is zero. It's about taking that little seed and planting it and believing so fervently that that little plant is going to grow into something that you can eat. You know, scientists can try and explain how this thing germinates, but my goodness, it must be godly in some way that here you can take a little thing like that and you can create a magnificent beetroot that you can put in a juicer and juice or you can roast in your oven and you can sit around a table and enjoy with your family and friends. And it's come from this little seed. southern tip of the country, another food-related initiative is helping people to connect with the source of their food. An indigenous plant nursery close to the Cape Point Nature Reserve offers forage and harvest courses which introduce people to the wild flavors that exist in our environment. For many participants, the course is a means of resetting their rhythms and getting back in touch with our natural environment. The courses typically start with the picking of indigenous edible plants, followed by a brief lecture on their nutritional and healing properties. 
Participants are also informed about the various stories and myths around each of the plants and are taught the importance of eating seasonally. So when you are foraging from the wild, it's, it's like a moment in time that you're capturing. It's like that wild season, that little wild moment. And so when you pick something and you serve it to somebody, it's like serving them the essence of that moment in time. These fresh pickings are then supplemented with a harvest from the adjacent organic garden. A throwback to times gone by when preparing meals was a slow, leisurely affair. The course, at its core, is communal in every way. Food is picked together, prepared together, and finally shared together in a spirit of gratitude. When people eat this way and they pick their own food, um, it's a, a consciousness of being grateful and for having a reverence for what is around us and the food tastes even that much more delicious. The garden of Frank and Ida near Kirstenbosch is a heartening example of a deep commitment to living in peaceful kinship with nature. Motivated by a desire to substantially reduce their ecological footprint, they set about adapting their home nearly 30 years ago. Today, with the help of solar panels, heat pumps and water tanks, they live almost entirely off the grid. Forgoing harmful chemicals, their fresh water natural pool uses plants to clean itself. According to the couple, they consider their garden at home to be their church and primary place of worship. Almost every scrap here is recycled or composted in this closed-loop ecosystem. A tennis court converted into a veggie garden with raised beds is a creative use of space that provides this family with many nutritious homegrown meals. Several beehives on the site add to the ideal of self-sufficiency and provide a natural security barrier at the bottom of the garden. Just a few hours in this idyllic, lovingly nurtured space where birds, bees and butterflies live together in perfect harmony offers visitors a tiny glimpse of what the Garden of Eden may have been like. Across the country, many faith groups are finding innovative ways of safeguarding the integrity of God's creation. The Season of Creation Liturgies, for example, has become a prominent yearly feature for the Anglican Church of Southern Africa. The Season of Creation originated in the Orthodox Church, and the Patriarch of the Orthodox Church um, set aside a season where the Church should think about creation and God the Creator and the Anglican Church um, about 10 years ago decided to also celebrate Season of Creation. So what we do during the month of September, um, leading up to the 4th of October, which is St. Francis Day, we encourage churches to focus on creation. And there are different themes. You can focus on water, land, the air, and um, some of the challenges like climate change, pollution, and also for it to be a season of creativity. So it's wonderful to see churches celebrating God the Creator at this time of year. On this cold and breezy morning, the group has gathered at the Edith Stevens Wetland Park to hear Father Sean Cosette conduct a sermon on stewardship. The brief pilgrimage starts with a short introduction on the wetland park itself, as well as a biblical narrative on creation. This is then followed by a moment of reflection and prayer. We often think that God only speaks to us through the written scripture. Um, the, in the early church, they had a, a strong belief that there are two books of God. There's the written book of God, and there is the book of nature, that God speaks to us through nature. And in the early church, actually, theological students would go out and study God in nature. So what we try to do with the church in um, creation is actually just to go out into creation and to hear God through the scripture, but also to hear God in nature. 
According to Reverend Mash, by listening to the voice of God out in nature, we become more attuned to our role as earth keepers. Our starting point as Christians when we engage with issues of the environment is not to ask what is wrong. It, it's rather to ask, are the things that God created still good? So if we say that God created the trees, are they still good? If we say God created the plants, can we still say today that it is good? If we start from that perspective, I believe we'll, we'll have a, a much better opportunity to, to be inspired and to see what needs to be done. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and God will dwell with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. We're all so busy rushing around trying to save creation that we forget to spend time in creation. And I think that's a wake-up call for all of us who are environmental activists. We need to slow down and smell the roses. We need to sit down and spend more time in creation and consciously get our strength from God, get our strength from creation. We don't get energy from being angry about climate change or being angry about things. We will get our strength that sustains us from a love of God's creation. And if our motivating force is the love of God's creation, then we truly can change the world. We can also start to change the world by making small shifts within our places of worship. Under the guidance of SAFSI, the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute, Christ Church in Constantia has undertaken the commitment to becoming an eco-congregation. Well, an eco-congregation is a congregation of any kind of religious faith which sets itself up as a center of excellence, a center of sustainability. So uh, a congregation might do an energy audit or a water audit, or they might establish some kind of um, system of, of having regular worship around nature, they might go on nature retreats, they might get involved in local or global advocacy actions. Um, so it's a variety of activities, but it's bringing environmental consciousness, eco-consciousness into the life and the activities of, the, of the, the faith community, whatever it happens to be. As part of their commitment to the environment, Christ Church Constantia set up a green team and conducted an eco-audit. We've been in existence since 2012, and in that time, we've tried to enable the community to focus on issues of the environment. And to that end, we've held two eco-fairs, plus we've held an energy and water audit here at the church to make people aware of why and how they are using energy and water as they are, and what changes they can make in their personal lives to mitigate against climate change. Also in Cape Town, the Saving Princess Flay campaign, in collaboration with the Jungle Theatre Company, has found a fun and creative way to raise awareness around the environment. Here, a carnival through the streets of Grassy Park helps to educate the public on the importance of Princess Flay, a much-loved recreational space in the area. The colourful and lively parade highlights the rich cultural and spiritual heritage surrounding the flay. Jungle Theatre Company, we take uh, traditional stories and we, we bring them back to life and make them relevant today. And a lot of our culture is around how in the past a lot of the stories come out of our connection to nature. So by telling our stories and, and bringing puppets and music and theatre into it, we make accessible theatre for children and families that connect our hearts to nature and to culture and to spirituality as well. The Birds Great Race is a Khoisan story that was told way back when and we read it in a book and we took that story and we actually told to the children of Lotus High 
and they then made puppets out of recycled materials. They built the, the, the characters from the play, the fish eagle, the mantis, the weaver bird, and all the other birds. And we then kind of made the, the, the story relevant to, to, to today, which, and here, to this location here, Princess Flay. According to the Khoisan legend, European colonizers abducted a 16th century Khoisan princess. The lake at Princess Flay is said to have been formed as a result of her tears. Enthusiastic campaigning by the local community has successfully foiled a planned bid by developers to turn the flay into a mall. And so now we're celebrating the fact that this is our flay and it's our community flay and we, we're using the story to connect people again to, to the flay. I sometimes wonder, and recently I've been taking a number of funerals of people, and I've raised the question of the mystery and wonder of life. Is it not a miracle that there's life on this incredible planet? The only planet that we know, the only planet certainly that we can experience, um, has this amazing life on it. What is the purpose of it, and how do we fit in to it? And I think that looking at nature, looking at the, the drive in, in all of nature, whether it's flowers, whether it's trees, whether it's fish, to continue the species, to continue this wonder of life is a part of, of, of God's purpose. With increasing urbanization and rapid advancements in agriculture, our general human assumption has been to regard the natural world as something out there, something separate from us. We tend to forget that we are an integral part of the intricate web of life. But as we grow in our appreciation of the infinite wonders of the world, we begin to understand our mutual interdependence with all of creation. As humans, we need a common narrative. We need something to unify us. And I think that the natural world gives that. And this focus on the natural world, every culture of all time has had a connection, a deep connection to nature. And so it is the ultimate unifier. And in this time especially, we need that. We need to look to the story that can remind us of who we really are. Nature for me is, it's our connection. It's the one place where we get a taste of what it means to be human. Nature to me has been my first love. As a child, I was brought up very much in, in the wild and, I, and, and so it was very much part of me. In fact, going to, to church was not the first place that I found God. God was really very much present in nature. For me personally, nature is sort of everything <laughs> because um, apart from the fact that um, we depend on nature for food, for um, basically everything, it's, it's a place where I can reflect and try to actually establish a relationship with my creator because although we don't see him, we see his creation and we can understand him through his creation. From a very young age, instead of going to the temple, um, I will be sitting and watching nature unfold. Uh, my childhood was in uh, uh, Kashmir in India and I would sit for hours watching the stalactites melting with the sun's rays going through and in splintering into these myriads of rainbow colors. That was God for me. That was inspiration for me. And there was something uh, magical, something amazing and beyond my, the comprehension of a little uh, six-year-old. There is something so incredibly deep I mean, I could even say godlike 
in that that amazes me. Intuition, God, and nature are all kind of one and the same. And what I learned often in the natural environment is that it's constantly living from a deep intuition. For me, nature is God speaking in wherever I look. So I see a tree and I see my oxygen being given to me by God. I see the oceans and I see the teaching of discipline because high tide and low tide, every day, the same time or the same period of time. And through that, I can learn about the discipline that ultimately gives me freedom. For some, it's about connecting to an all-pervading, unconditional, universal love that has no boundaries. In Sufism, there is a, a concept that uh, the heart is represented by the sun. And this whole beautiful relationship between the earth and the sun represents the love between oneself and God. With her seemingly endless capacity to creatively inspire and sustain us, Mother Nature also heals us at a physical level and leaves our weary spirits refreshed and renewed. Just looking at the sky, just looking at the grass, just listening to a bird is something that energizes the spirit, that energizes the soul, energizes the mind. If we are generous with nature, it will be infinitely more generous with us. And so it's that beautiful reciprocity that I think is inspirational. And you find it in a single grain of sand, in one flower blooming. If I take time to appreciate each of those things, then I feel completely fulfilled. My life is fantastic. And I will live and I will die, just like everything else on Earth. And so let me give as much back to the world as that gladiolus that I get to see on the side of the mountain. May that beauty be there. And yeah, somehow there's that generosity in life. And I'd like to be part of that generosity. When I write music, most of it is inspired by nature. I always position myself in a, in a place where I can watch the clouds drifting over the mountain. I can hear the sea. I, uh, I can listen to the birds. For me, nature really, really can reconnects us. It is the ultimate expression of God's love for us. Uh, the ultimate expression of perfection and beauty and uh, all we have to do is go quiet. We just have to lose ourselves and merge into this blissful state of reconnection with nature and listen. It is so musical when you just listen to nature. To learn nature's sacred secrets, we must first learn to cherish and protect her, to approach her in a spirit of respect and reverence. It all starts with us. Our individual efforts, no matter how small, can make a profound and lasting change. There's one Rumi saying which I really love, um, and I think it's very applicable if we're going to make a change um, towards climate change and poverty, inequality, our general uh, standard of living. And that is, um, he said that I was once clever and I tried to change the world. And then I became wise and I changed myself. Shanti 
The world's religions teach that the universe was created through love by God. Creation did not happen by accident, but was created by God for a purpose. While it would be arrogant for us humans to say we fully understand this purpose, it remains our responsibility to take care of and respect that which God has created. In creation, every plant, insect, animal and human being is intrinsically valuable. God's design or purpose for creation reflects His intention that all creatures enjoy perfect love and justice. Together with our assigned tasks as caretakers of the earth, God gave humans the intelligence to reason and reflect, to learn and teach, to have some understanding of God and of God's vast and complex designs. Perhaps then, the purpose of life is to help bring about God's glorious plan for creation. And it's now time for all people of faith to understand their responsibilities, not only to their loved ones and their communities, but for the very survival of the earth and all its inhabitants. Hey, you know.